Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you uh, briefly today. What I'd like to do is uh, lay out National's approach to solving our housing crisis, including the important role of community housing providers. I want to start by acknowledging Paul, your Chief Executive, but also my associate, Tama Portaka, who's just a new MP and has taken on the uh, weighty role of uh, associate housing spokesperson looking specifically at social and community housing. Um, I'm going to speak for a few minutes and then hand over to him. Um, but I particularly want to acknowledge all of you uh, in the room who work at the front line uh, of the disaster that is housing in this country. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for what you do. And I want to be right up front from the start. We value community housing providers in the National Party. We know that you are more nimble, more agile, and generally provide much better care for the people you look after than the government providers do. We want to see the community housing sector grow, uh, and the next national-led government will be very focused on that. It's a shame, in my view, that the current government is obsessed with expanding Kainga Ora at the expense of the community sector. The balance is wrong. Um, so before I hand over to Tama to talk uh, a bit about, specifically about uh, CHIPS, I want to talk about our housing catastrophe and what national plans to do about it. Now you see it every day, so I won't labour the, the point, but housing in New Zealand has been a public policy disaster for at least the last 30 years. And by the way, it's got worse in the last six years, not better. Despite being a country of only just over 5 million people with a landmass the size of the United Kingdom, we have some of the least affordable housing in the developed world. And over the last 20 years, New Zealand has experienced faster growth in real house prices than any other OECD country. Nationwide median rents have risen by $175 in the last five years, placing huge pressure on many families. And those rent increases have forced more and more people onto uh, the social housing register. Waitlist is now uh, up to 24,000 applicants, nearly 20,000 more than six years ago. And then we get to the catastrophe that is the emergency housing system. Now, it started as a short-term measure, and it started under national. It was designed to put a roof over a family's heads for a few nights before they moved into permanent housing. But it has turned into a permanent part of our housing mix and an institutionalised part of the government bureaucracy. It is an economic and social disaster. 3,500 families in motels, 3,000 kids, the average length of stay used to be three weeks, it's now 21 weeks. As a country, the government spends a million dollars per day housing people in motels. Since 2017, that's $1.3 billion. And I want to be very clear with you. It is utterly disgraceful that in a country as wealthy as New Zealand, we have managed to create a society in which thousands of our fellow Kiwis spend month after month living in misery in motels, and even worse, in their cars. And the tragedy last week in my hometown of Wellington should be a wake-up call for the country about how bad things are. Loafers Lodge is our Grenfell Tower. There isn't just one Loafers Lodge, they exist all over New Zealand. And unless we fix our housing market, tragedies like we saw last week will happen again. So we are determined to really address the root causes of why it happened. And we want to do what, it do what we need to do to make sure it never happens again. Now, some of the policies we've already announced will make a difference in sorting this mess out. Uh, as you all know so well in this room, the housing system is complicated. It's a continuum from private housing through to private rentals, social housing, emergency providers. We do want to make some common sense changes to private rentals to encourage landlords back into the market to put downward pressure on rents. The big driver of the wait list is the sheer unaffordability of rentals in many parts of the country. So we will bring back interest deductibility for private rentals, we will take the Bright Line test back to two years, and we will repeal two of Labor's misguided changes to the Residential Tenancies Act that have had the opposite effect to what they were designed to do. These are progressive policies to help improve the rental market. But ultimately, the way in which we will solve our housing crisis at every level is more supply of houses. We need a building bonanza at every level of the market from private housing, mum and dad landlord owned rentals, build to rent developments, and social and community housing. Now we're going to announce our full housing policy soon, but I want to let you know about the direction of travel. 
First, it's imperative we free up land inside and at the edges of our cities. The big driver of house price growth in recent decades is limited land supply. We are not a small country, but government fiat has artificially constrained where and how we can build. We want competitive urban land markets in and around our cities so that artificially inflated land values don't spread throughout the housing market, driving up prices and rents. Second, we need infrastructure funding and financing reform to make sure insufficient infrastructure isn't a barrier to new housing. Now, local government rightly says that housing density and housing growth has to come with the right infrastructure. Councils have constrained balance sheets, but there are innovative ways around that. And our transport planning system also has to facilitate growth, not stop it. I think of new state highways like State Highway 29 outside, outside Tauranga that could unlock 50,000 new houses, or Petone de Granada and Wellington in the Hutt Valley. But I also think of the enormous intensification opportunities from high quality rapid transit uh, in our cities, our major cities. Thirdly, we need to make sure that communities share in the benefits of housing growth. The political economy in too many communities and too many councils is stacked against housing growth. My very clear message to you and to New Zealanders is that housing growth is good. It means fewer kids in motels, it means more people in warm and dry homes, more young people getting into a first home, it means reduced government expenditure on housing subsidies, which last year topped $4 billion. And it also means a more productive economy. Now there's a role here for central government to help change the calculus from, I would say, ambivalence in some councils, bordering on outright hostility to, to uh, housing, to change it to enthusiasm for more growth. We'll have more to say about that soon. What I've just talked about is what I call the housing trifecta. Housing growth, infrastructure, community benefit, and making progress on all of those things will make a demonstrable difference to New Zealand, and we need to do it. I'm now gonna hand over to Tama, my associate spokesperson, to talk specifically about community housing. And can I finish by um, reiterating what I said at the start and saying thank you for what you do. We want to work with you if we have the privilege of leading the next government to help you grow, to help us address social problems in New Zealand. Thanks very much. Tēnā tātou katoa e te hau kainga ka pāki whakatekatekao waitaha ngā te mamoe me kaitahu. Kei te mihi aku tuahine, Victoria, Jade, love you Jersey, and koutou ko Yvonne Ma, me o koutou momo, ngā mihi i o koutou mahi rangatira. Koutou katoa, whakatau mai, mai o ha mai te kaupapotara, and all those folks from Kirikiriroa, Chiefs and Manawa forever. Kia ora. Yay! Especially the ones on Hamilton West. It's a great privilege to be here amongst you. I'm new to politics and housing, of course. Chris, he's Maverick, and I'm Rooster. He said at the start that uh, we've got to value what you do. We do value what you do, and want you to help sustainably grow uh, homes, but also help people in those homes. And it's been great getting around the motu, meeting some of you, like uh, our mates from Accessible, uh, Julie, I caught her up on Zoom, um, Stephen at Court, and others, Brian, Donnelly. Seeing firsthand and listening to the excellent mahi that you all are doing. Some of you are going large, some tiny, uh, but we're all with the focus of helping people and helping people get into adequate housing and ultimately a better chance at life. Now, how the government facilitates community and Social housing actually speaks to a major philosophical issue between national and labour. The Labour government, in our view, is very proud, and that's awesome, dominating the social housing supply and tenancy management and the number of houses KAHU has built is repeated ad nauseum. Reminds me of the Lorax, just keeps on biggering and biggering. National, we will be proud when together, community, business and government reduce the numbers of homelessness kids and adults living in cars and motels, and the social housing waitlist. It's a slightly different way of looking at things. We actually believe who owns a social house matters far less than the quality of care, pastoral or manaakitanga, that the whānau receive and the opportunities for a better home and life that it provides. We are absolutely infatuated with outcomes for families and individuals, more so than the bricks and mortar. We believe more in yourselves, chips, iwi Māori and others and that you should be more disproportionately favoured or funded for housing through the IRRS arrangements. 
And in the last few years, we've seen that philosophy put into practice. Community and social housing providers have used the funding model set up by Sir Wudamu Ingarihi, Sir Bill English, and the last national-led government, and have grown. But you have chafed against the government that wants to direct the majority of its time, energy, and capital into the state-funded monopoly. As Sir Wudamu says, kind order acts nearly as all monopolies do, badly. We in National are very worried about kind order and its underperformance. While it has huge responsibility of being its own consenting authority, and there are some advantages of the consentium and related processes, the cost of construction of new homes is too high. It's been on a land brine spree, sometimes bidding against iwi. I know I've had that own personal welcome experience myself. First home buyers and genuine developers. High overheads, ever-grown staff numbers, and a tendency to sink costs and feasibilities. First hand, I have seen kainga order toy with genuine aspirations across credible iwi providers to build communities at scale for Kiwis. And Kaing Order just toys with those iwi. And it's unfair. While Kaing Order might be good at PR messaging about what a great job it's doing, it can operate in a manner that consumes council and industry resource to the detriment of housing providers, coming across as precasting itself as a kingmaker throughout the housing market, housing market however, undermining the very foundations of land availability, housing supply and affordability. The budget last week, kia ora, $3 billion into capital funding for 3,000 new public homes. If that means a $1 million per home, I'm staggered. It's starting to sound like Hamilton East. The agency, loaded with debt but requires more and more injections of money to carry on with the developments it's already been funded for, a national government will supercharge social housing and ultimately good homes for Fano outside of Planet KO. We will have more to say soon on that, but I want to share a few ideas with you now. Long-term funding pipelines. The question for us is where's the public housing plan 2024 onwards? And no doubt people will turn up tomorrow and announce them, but why does it take to the middle of an election year to give you funding certainty around IRS funding for the next year and beyond? It's about as timely as the recent Matatini funding announcement after the large Māori caucus spent six years of wondering and pondering. I know some developments have fallen over just because of that IRR certainty, and I'm sure some of you do here today. Second, longer-term contracts. We're up again for 25 funding arrangements with new renewal periods that allow CHIPS to obtain finance and get developments away. Some feedback that I've had is that MHUD MH is a bit reluctant to sign these contracts. I think you'll find that our party is a bit more supportive. Capital funding. As I've said, the government directs most of its housing capital to kind order. It doesn't have to be that way and capital funding from the previous government helped really helped develop the community housing sector. Fourth, the social investment framework. You might have heard people talking about that before. Certainly Sir Bill and Nicola Willis, our finance spokesperson, deputy leader, is hot on that. When we look at the social housing register, applicants on the register, class from A20 to B8, ranked an urgency of need from high to low. But the system is possibly unresponsive to people's individual circumstances. A social investment framework would allow providers to access more funding for those in urgent need or top up or premium on the IRRS subsidy, for example, reflecting the greater social impact and benefits of getting in high housing need into housing. So where there's greater risks, you should get a bit more of a premium reward. Let me close again by saying and reiterating what uh, Chris uh, Bishop has said. We thank you for the things that you're doing for communities, for Fano for people in need. Our party's vision is about building a safe, prosperous and successful country where all Kiwis have the opportunities to reach their personal dreams and goals. For National, this involves a thriving and growing chip sector, looking after increasing numbers of Kiwis to build their home and have better pathways to independence. And I hope that Chris, myself and others within the party will get the chance to do that with you more effectively after October 14. Kia ora.